Hello again. I am back with another clock to repair. It's a Telecron, but what makes this one different for me is the history of it, the provenance, so to speak. Instead of finding it at a flea market or on eBay as a non-working parts-only clock, this one belongs to my wife's best friend, Karen, her BFF. We were visiting her in Orlando, and she shows me this clock, saying that it belonged to her grandmother, her Nana. She remembers seeing it as a kid on the mantle in her grandmother's home in Pennsylvania. She was born in the 1890s, and when she died around 1968, it went to Karen's mom. When her mom died in 2002, it went to her sister. Then about seven or eight years ago, she is visiting her sister and sees the clock in a pile of stuff to be thrown away. She takes it from the pile, notices a couple of the finials are broken off and finds them, and actually reattaches them to the clock. Uh, initially, I didn't notice the repair. You have to look very closely to see the line where it was reattached. I did see that it was missing the plug. When I got home, I looked up the clock in my Telecron time book. It's called the Oxford and was made from 1928 to 1931. As Karen's mom was born in 1933, there's a good chance that this clock was a wedding gift to her grandmother. What is interesting is that the book gives the model number as 524 but the plate on the back of it says the model number is H1. Most of the Telecron clocks have model numbers with one letter and three or four numbers. To see one that says H1 suggests to me that it's maybe a very early clock of this type, maybe even older than 1928. I do see a difference from this one to the one in the book. It's missing the base. I don't know how a base could have come off and come off without damaging the edge of the case. The bottom is open, and I'll show you what that looks like. It definitely looks as if a base was attached here at one time in the past. I can show you a picture of this clock in my Telecron time book. And you can clearly see that there's a base on the bottom of it. Other than that, they're pretty much identical. In any event, it's a clock that's over 90 years old. And when I start to repair it, what I want to try to do, first of all, is I want to handle the case very carefully and not run the risk of breaking off any of these finials. I think that it's quite fragile. Secondly, I'm not sure yet if it just needs a new plug on the wire to get it running or if there's an issue with the um, uh, oil-filled rotor. Those have a tendency, have a history of drying out or leaking out, and it causes the rotor to stop turning. And on the back of it, the power cord seems to be attached by some kind of a plug. And it wiggles around, but I'm really unable to remove it. I don't plan on forcing it. I'll figure out how it's attached once I get the back off. I've seen other Telecom clocks that I've worked on that had this design, but the entire plug and wire was missing. This is the first time I've seen one of these intact. So the first step I'm going to do is remove the back, and I'll get started on that. What I'm seeing here on the back, it's not really screws. It's sort of three round nuts, so to speak. One here, here, and here. And I'm going to have to probably use a pair of pliers to undo them. And then I'm thinking that this little back plate should come off. And then we'll see if the whole clock comes out from the back or not, or if it falls out through the front, most likely. So let me work on that, and then we'll continue. Once I loosen the nuts a little bit here, there's a slot in the head, and I can just unscrew them with a screwdriver at that point. And there's one. And two. And three. Okay. And as I was hoping, the whole thing comes out through the front. So I'm going to put the case aside for now and I don't even want to mess with it until 
it's time to try to clean up the finish and whatnot on here. So put this aside. And next, I have to take a close look at what's going on here and figure out how the best way to take this apart. So let me take a look and then we'll continue. And what I'd like to do here and what I recommend to anyone who's looking to take apart a clock and trying to fix it is I'll start to take some photos of each step before I remove parts so I have a good record of how it's supposed to look when I put it back together. This particular one definitely looks a lot older than any of the telecrons I've previously been dealing with. So to start, I do see three nuts holding this back plate on. So we'll undo those three and then see about removing it. But first I'll take a couple of pictures. I've removed two of the three. Let's take off the third one. And the plate is still on kind of tight. I have two screws here that go into these posts on the inside. So let me take these two out next and we'll see what happens. And these two are quite snug. Now, before I try pressing down hard on this to undo the screw, I'm concerned about the force breaking the glass on the front here because it is sitting on the table. So I'm going to cushion it with a little towel here. So when I give that a good turn, hopefully nothing gets damaged. Okay, let's try again. There we go. It's tight all the way. Seems like one rather large screw. There we go, that's one. Okay. And then we have the back plate. And let me take a closer look before trying to remove it. Now, this is the set knob over here. And before trying to take this plate off, I have to remove it. And the only way to do that is I have to grip the stem here with a, with a vice grip plier. And then I can unscrew the, uh, the knob. Okay. Oh, this whole thing is coming apart here. Wow. Can't believe that went there. Let me take a photo or two of this before I really pull everything apart. I'll try to show as much as I can as I go here. There's a couple of little support, little posts that sit here. I'll take those off.
and this is the coil and the coil assembly. This is the rotor. I'll see if I can slip it off. Okay. I'm going to take a closer look at all of this before I proceed. A few things I'm noticing right off the bat with this one is it's definitely the oldest Telecron clock that I've ever seen. Uh, the coil is much larger than what I'm used to seeing on other clocks. The whole connection here with this plug in the plate is totally different. I have to figure out how I'm going to remove that. And this rotor is by far much larger than any that I've seen before. But what I want to figure out to do next is I want to take off the front, get the glass and the brass rim out of here in the hands so I don't damage any of that as I continue to take the whole thing apart. So let me figure that out and then we'll continue. But something else I'm also noticing when I took this plate off of here and there were three little nuts securing it, once I took it off, I see there's three additional nuts sitting on these screw posts, which controls the height at which that plate is sitting there. And these can be turned and I don't want to adjust the positioning of them. So I'm going to put a little piece of tape under each of these nuts so that they don't accidentally get turned either too far up or down. So let me do that as well. I've placed some tape around underneath each of the three nuts and it looks as if I can just lift this whole thing right out. Uh, but before I do, I want to just mark the position of these plates in reference to the 12 on the front, which is right here. This is the 12. So I'll put a dot here and one here. And let me get ready to lift that out. I took a step backwards. As you can see, it's back together. When I started to remove everything, it everything was rotating to such a degree that it was things were getting really knocked out of whack as far as where the 12 was in reference to the positioning of the plate here. So I need to do a better job of just marking the positioning of everything before I take this apart uh, a second time. So let me work on that and then we'll continue. What I did was using three different colors of nail polish. I just put a little dot on each plate or piece that's able to be rotated out of position. And that way I should have a pretty good reference for putting everything back together. So now we'll go back to taking everything apart. Okay, we got that off again. Leave that on the side. And as I was saying earlier, I think this whole thing just might lift out now. There we go. Let me take a closer look at all of this, figure out how I want to take it all apart. For now though, we'll put the glass aside. And 
the brass rim. And we'll concentrate on this. What I want to do now, and let me move in a little closer, make it easy for you to see, is figure out how these hands are attached. If sometimes on the older clocks, the second hand could be threaded on here, or it just could be a friction grip having to pry it off. So I need to look at that a bit more closely before I try to remove it, because I don't want to damage it if I pick the wrong uh, choice. And just to show again what I meant about how everything's moving about, this piece just totally rotates. So if it wasn't for these little dots that I have here, I could easily put it back together in the wrong position. One thing I'm going to try to do in terms of getting off the hands, these old rotors, the gear that rotates tends to be right down the middle rather than a, a gear that touches another gear that touches another gear that makes the second hand spin. So this may just be attached directly to the rotor, which means I might be able to just lift it straight out. And that's the case. So that came off rather easy. Let's see how we do with the next one. Okay, these are on rather snug. I may have to put a little WD-40 on here to kind of lubricate it before trying to pry those off. I'm pretty sure they're not threaded. I think they're just friction gripped. So when I get set up for that. Also, once I removed the second hand that freed up the rotor, it just came right out of the back. And I'll look at that more closely later. For now, I just spray a bit of WD-40 into a little cup, and I'm just going to apply it around the, the hands. And I'll give that a good 10 minutes or so, let it soak in before trying to remove them. I've been looking at it pretty closely, and what I'm realizing is that these hands are secured by a nut, and it's not budging. The WD-40 hasn't loosened it at all, so I'm going to try to apply some liquid wrench around it, and hopefully that'll free it up. Right now, I'm not able to freeze the hands to keep them from moving as I try to rotate this nut, so we'll try that and see if I get lucky. Okay, I've applied the liquid wrench and I want to protect the dial. I don't want to scratch it up as I try to remove it with pliers. So I cut a piece of cardboard to slide under the hands here. And hopefully that will protect everything. And now I'm just going to try to gently undo the nut here. I do believe it's turning a little bit. I'm just going to go very slowly with this, and then once I get it removed, I'll continue. I've loosened it up and should be able to remove it now. And the hands should slide off as well as one. And the hour hand, that's not coming off so easily. So I got to look more closely to see what's up with that one. What I think might work is I might be able to just pry up this hour hand. There we go. We 
you've got it. One thing I'm noticing, these hands are painted and some of the paint is flaking off. So I may just repaint, I'll spray paint the hands black. Okay. Now this dial should come off. Okay. Now I gotta take a close look to see how we access the gears that are in here. And once I figure that out, we'll continue. But before I do that, one thing I like to always check is if the coil in these clocks is still intact. And to do that, I use an ohm meter connected to the wire here and see if we have continuity within the circuit. When I touch the leads to the end of the wire here, we should see numbers flashing. Okay, so this is intact and it should be repairable. What I want to do next is check to see if the rotor is still working. And I have two ways to do that. One is I can place it back into the coil assembly here. I'd have to attach a plug to the, to the power cord, plug it in and see if it's working. An easier way is I have another coil assembly here. This is from one of the newer Telecrons, and by that I mean the 1930s. It's, you can see how much smaller it is than the older one. And in theory though, if I put the rotor in here and plug it in, it should still work regardless of which one I'm using. So let's give this a shot. And it is working. Let's see if I can show you this. This spins at just one revolution per minute. If you recall, the second hand fit right into it, and that's how you get it turning once per minute. As compared to the more modern or newer rotors, which is this kind, you can see how much smaller it is. And these rotate at 3.6 revolutions per minute. And they list all of these rotors in the book that I was talking about. I've been calling it the Telecron Time Book. The correct name of it is actually Electrifying Time. It's the whole history of the Telecron clocks. And here are photos of all the various rotors that they use. These are the larger ones. They call it the B type. And the most recent one is the H. So they've gone through quite a few letters in making different styles of rotors. But this is working. I can shut it off. And the next step, I'm going to look to access the gears in here, clean everything up, lubricate it. And to do that, it seems there are four screws holding these plates together. So I just have to undo the four of them to remove it. Let me clean all this out of the way. I'll get set up and do that next. I've taken out three of the four. I'll do the last one now. And now I just want to lift this plate straight up so I don't disturb the gears that are underneath it. Hopefully it'll come off easy. I see one gear hanging up here. Unless it's stuck to this plate. Okay, I'll have to put it back together because this uh, I have one stem that's hanging it up. So let me pop this back on. Oh no, I got it. There we go. Okay, what I want to do is just take a couple of photos of this so I have the proper positioning of everything once I take it apart. What I'm seeing is that a lot of oil has leaked out of the rotor and the gears are all covered in it. 
And in cases like this, what I usually do is I would open up the rotor, clean out the old oil and re-lubricate it, which is something I've learned how to do on this type of a rotor. There's a safe spot to drill a hole in here to access uh, the inside without damaging the gears. I'm not familiar enough with this type of a rotor um, to have the confidence to drill a hole into it. I'd be worried about damaging the gears. But because this one is working, I'll probably just use it as it is and should the clock ever stop in the future, I can always take it apart and then take a chance on opening it up. What I'm going to do now is remove these gears one at a time and I'll take a photo of it just so I know the exact positioning of it. And then I'll work on cleaning them up. This is really a very simple design. There's only four gears here. To remove them, I have to move this aside. That's the power interruption indicator. And let me take out one. and this gear is riveted in place I can't get it out and on the front plate another gear that's also seems to be locked on with a collar here so to clean these up I'll probably soak them in an ultrasonic cleaner with some hot soapy water and that should clean everything up quite well let me work on that and then we'll continue I've cleaned and lubricated all the gears and parts and now we just have to reassemble it Okay, it's lined up correctly. I just have to put in the three screws now. So I'll do that and then we'll continue. The screws are back in, everything is secured. What I want to do next is place the rotor back into the coil assembly. It's going to sit in here. And in looking at the wiring here, this is the original cloth covered wiring from the coil to the plug here. On this side, I believe this could be a replacement wire, but the connection here seems to be in such good condition, I see no need to replace any of it. So what I'm gonna work on now is just reattaching the plate onto here. And once I have that on, I will continue. I'm gonna to try to show as much of this as I can, but um, basically just reversing the steps that I did when I took everything apart. But this is going to fit in here. And these sat here. And we'll see how easy I can pop this on. I have to maneuver these posts around. That'll take a little bit of time. So let me do that before we continue. I've positioned the plate over the two stems here. This one is the set knob stem, and this is the power interruption indicator reset stem. Next, I'm gonna seat the little plate that has the uh, model number information on it and secure it with these two screws. I'll do all that, and then we'll continue. Everything's back together and secured. And what I want to do before I go any further with it is I'm going to attach a plug to the wire. 
I'm going to look to see both the second hand and the minute hand and plug it in and see if it's working. So I'll do all of that and then we'll continue. A slight change of plans. When I was looking more closely at the wire going into this plug here, I can see some of the wires that are exposed. It's hard for you to see, I think, but I'm concerned that this connection might be weakening. So it looks like I'm going to have to go ahead and remove this plug. I have a couple of screws here and a couple of nuts on this side. And odds are this plug will just pop right out. So I'll start to take that apart and see how we do. There's one. And two. Uh, looks like this whole thing is coming out of the plate. Okay, this may take a while. I gotta go slowly and look at it more closely. And when I figure it out, I'll return. Okay, I figured it out. This actually just unplugs from here. It was really quite tight. I put the screws and the nuts back in. Just like that. Almost looks like a plug on this side. And what I'm seeing here is a screw holding this plug to the wire. So I'm gonna take this apart and figure out how to just reconnect the wiring to it. So let me work on that and then we'll continue. I've opened up the plug and I'm gonna to try to show what it was that I saw. There's wiring exposed. The insulation doesn't go quite all the way to where the screws attach this uh, the little prongs here so I'm going to remove them shorten the wire and get the uh, insulation right up against here looking at it from the inside I could see exposed wire it almost looked as if they had the potential to be touching each other which obviously could have caused the short so let me work on reattaching this wire to these screws here and once that's done I'll continue I'll try to show what I did I have it attached now where the insulation is going all the way in past the edge of the, the plug here. So there's no exposed wires at all. Uh, I'm going to put the other half on, screw it together, and then we can continue from there. Now, when I look into the back of the plug, I don't see any exposed wire at all. So we'll reattach this to the back of the clock. And what I had started to do before I got involved with that is, I'm gonna see both the minute hand and second hand, attach a plug to the end of the wire and see if it's working. Once I've done all that, uh, we'll continue. I've attached the plug, I've seated the minute hand and the second hand. It's plugged in and we'll turn it on. And it's running. I'm gonna let it go for several minutes make sure the minute hand is working properly. And once I'm certain that everything is good, we can start to reassemble everything. It's been running now for several hours and I'm satisfied that everything is working properly. But before I reassemble everything, I wanna clean up 
the glass. I'm going to polish up the brass rim. I also wanted to spray paint the hands because some of the paint was chipping off of it. What I also wanted to do was to demonstrate how the power interruption indicator works. On the newer clocks that they made, and I'm talking the 1930s and 1940s, when the power is turned off, the white little flag flips down to red. And when the power came back on to reset it, you'd turn the clock upside down and back up. This one has a stem in the back. This is the reset stem. And the way it works is once the power is turned off, it flips down to red. And it has to be pretty upright to see what happens. Once the power comes back on, you have to just turn the stem to reset it to white. Again, power off, it drops down to red. Anyway, I'm going to get to work on cleaning everything, and then we'll continue. Okay, what I've done is I polished up the rim. I used some brass soap, brass polish for that. Cleaned up the glass. Cleaned the dial. And spray painted the hands black so they're looking good again. And now I get to reassemble everything. First, I have to put on the set knob. Then the dial, and the hands. Now the hour hand is going to fit any direction. It's round, it'll fit anywhere you put it. But the minute hand only goes one way. So once you've seated it, you then have to turn that to the 12. Then remove this and then seat the hour hand. Then we'll put, reposition the minute hand and both will be pointing at the 12. And then just secure it with the nut. and then just tighten it up a bit. And the second hand. And the glass. Next, I have to manipulate the rim back through the dial into the little holes on the plate here. And that's going to take a bit of time, so I'll work on that, and then we'll continue. I've seated the outer plate back over the, the front of the clock. I've secured it with the three nuts. Everything is intact and solid. And the next step would normally be to insert this back into the case. But before I do that, I have to clean and polish the case, and I'll show you the products I plan to use for that. What I like to use is... It's... 
Spruce's wood floor cleaner. It's meant for laminated wood floors, but it also cleans the dirt off of unfinished wood or just stained wood like this. And after 90 years, there's, I'm sure there's a lot of dirt coating this. I followed that up with Howard's Restore Finish, which this case doesn't need all that much work. There's really little to no scratches in it. And then lastly, I'll use Howard's Feed and Wax, which is a wax polish. And that'll take some time to do. I will get this case cleaned and polished, and then we'll continue from there. I finished treating the case, and I think it came out looking pretty good. So the next step now is to place the clock back into it. Okay, what I have to do next is secure this ring back into position and then we'll be finished. Let me work on that and then we'll continue. I've positioned the ring and screwed it back down and now we'll set it up and make sure that it works. There it is, it's up and running, the Telecron Oxford from 1928. I know this was an incredibly long video. I hope you were able to hang in there for it, but it definitely had some issues that I hadn't really come across before. Now I plan to carefully package it up and I'll send it back down to Karen. I'm sure she's going to enjoy getting this back. That pretty much wraps things up. Bye for now.